Lucky you. 36 Turn pistols and golf. Alternate Shots Podcast. Barney's Army. Where we talk about golf. Sandy. Poker. James Bond. Horse racing. Double. Classic movies. Zenyatta. We have no script. Down the stretch they come. We are glad you joined us. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> Billy Regan back out again. How are you? How was your weekend? Good, Bobby Williams. And I'm happy to see below both of us here, Mr. Mike Durkin, one of my favorite human beings. <laughs> Mike Durkin, how are you? Uh, all's good, boys. For the listeners who don't know you, Mike is an assistant pro at Winged Foot for how many years? I'm pushing 30. Uh, wow. You know, I'm, I'm not quite there yet. So like 1993 it's, or so when you hired or four? So my uh, I my first year was 1993. That's the first year I worked at Wink Foot. And um, so we came, it, we came in together, basically. I, I remember it clear as day only because of this, because the, the big tree on 10 East went down in December of 92. So my first year there was the first year that that tree was gone. And I just remember, you know, I would stand and I was working in the bag room and I would stand in the bag drop and everyone who came in would just be like, you know, oh, the tree is gone. Or like, <laughs> or they'd get out of the car and be like, something's different. And I'd be yeah. like, oh yeah, there used to be a big tree over there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then- Kind uh, of a big tree. Yeah. And I remember, I remember it clear as day, like it was yesterday, it was- I think it was Mrs. Kellenberger and she gets back and she gets out of the car and she looks around and the tree is gone and she just I could tell she's panicked and, and I go over to her and I look at her and I was like what's wrong and she's like I feel violated so, <laughs> so I'm standing there and I'm like man these people really like their trees you know <laughs> because it was and then you'd go in the pro shop and they had pieces of the tree for sale. Like Tom was selling pieces of the tree. And I was like, oh, they really like their trees around here. I was like, I better get used to this place I'm working at. So I was like, I go in the pro shop and I look at the book, you know, and it's Douglas LaRue's book. The people, the golf, the friendly trees, wink, you know, so. I read the book and it's like, oh, okay. And you get to the back and the last 40 pages of the book are all just trees, <laughs> trees, trees, trees. So, you know, I was like, oh, these people really like their trees. <laughs> Probably this was before the, before the onslaught that. of taking down trees. And then trees you fast now. forward, fast forward six years, six years later, they cut down every tree. In, in Westchester. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that was 1993. 19 Evolution. Who hired you? So, well, I went to high school with a uh, guy named Peter Gardella, who um, worked here. He was Jim Noletti, I think, or he was his nephew. Jim Noletti was the manager. Yeah. So Pete was his nephew, and Pete, he got Pete a job, went to Concordia, which is where we grew up in, in Bronxville, Eastchester area. He never went away to college, so he he was working here while he went to Concordia. So he had like a four year head start on me. But, um, you know, I'd come home in the summers from college and he would say, oh, come on over to Wingfoot and play. And, uh, you know, he loved golf, that kid. Um, and he probably worked here for about, I'd say 10 years from like the late eighties to the late nineties. But he's the one that got me in here. Really nice. And that was under so, Tom, right? Under Tom Neoporti was the head pro then? Yeah, definitely Tom. So Tom yeah. was, uh, you know, Tom was probably still in his prime at that point. So he was. Mike Durkin's first pro he worked for was Tom Neoporti. Let's hear from Tom. And also think of who walked the fairways before me or and is going to swing, walk them after me. Yeah, I don't think. There's a day, you know, that I come to work that I don't enjoy myself. So I'm really doing something I really love. Now, Tom spends his time helping other players polish their skills. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I started, it was basically Jay Neoporty ran everything. Yep. So I remember I came in and Jay was like, hey, you know, you want to work? It was like a two-minute thing. Like, <laughs> okay. And 
That's where I started. I started in the bag room. And then moved into club repair? Well, like when I started, Mo was here. That Tom, at one point, showed me his contract that he had when he got hired, and I read it. And, you know, one of the clauses in there was like, you always had to have a qualified club repair, you know, tactician on staff. You, you know, it was like written out. And I think it was so that Tom would keep Mo when he took the job. It was like, you know, it was guaranteed right. that Mo had a job. So, um, but Mo was, you know, at that point, uh, he was he was 80 years old. And it was also about the point where, uh, you know, like there were no more wood clubs, like they were starting to be phased out. So, um, you know, Mo's kind of services at that point were not needed anymore. And, uh, but I did, you know, in my early years, I had to fix clubs, you know, we had a, uh, there was a guy in Ride, uh, Larry Antonazzi, yep. white, dot. white Dot Golf Shop. Yep. He was a crazy old Italian guy. And I used to go over there and he'd fix clubs. And, uh, you know, but then I got sick of going over there and then I got sick of sending stuff out. So I started fixing clubs myself and I learned a little bit on the, learned a little bit from Mo, learned a little bit on my own and just had a necessity for the most part. But I will say when, when Mo was here early on, there were still some guys using persimmon clubs and, uh, you know, Mo had all those skills. Like he could re-whip and reattach and he could, re, you know, he- Because in his there was heyday, some kind of twine, right? That's the little, uh, it was like a little fine sort of uh, wire that you yeah. wrap around the bottom. And now you use a little plastic ferrule, but, um, you know, Mo was able to tie all those things up and he was able to, you know, he could do the sole plates and replace them and you know in his heyday he could even you know refinish a wood club which was took a lot of work and a lot of talent and uh, Marmon, he, he he bent his 56 degree wedge about 63 or 64 degrees uh what didn't we find that out from one of the Harmon boys they they found Claude's wedge Jesus. here in the 1959 US Open and got it up and down from everywhere and uh, Dickie took it to the Lyloff machine. That's what Billy taught me. You use those all day long, right, Mike? And he checked yep. it out. It was like, he says, well, maybe Dave Pels didn't invent the uh, lob wedge. <laughs> I remember the Moe's Pros was in 1988. Woo! That's all he needed. This guy, Peter, definitely are the leaders. So it was five years after his retirement, um, but, you know, we, I got along great with him because he would basically get here really early in the morning and he left at 1130, like as soon as he could get lunch, he would get his lunch and leave. So I would basically show up at 10 and I only had to deal with him for an hour and uh, which was fine. But he was, you know, he wasn't um, he wasn't the easiest to work with because he was he was a stickler and he was he was kind of tough on you. Um, you know, I used to remember he I'd come in and he'd yell at me because everything was dirty and like, you know, this guy's head cover was missing and you know, but um, but he was a perfectionist. But now that I think back on it, I have I have nothing but the ultimate respect for the man because, I mean, to last, I like I said, I'm almost here 30 years. I feel like I've been here forever. He was there 70 years. I mean, 65, 70 years. Like, 
it means I got another 50, 45, 50 to go <laughs> yeah. to catch it. But you I'll, gotta, you gotta be I'll tell you this story about Mo. I got it from Tom. Tom got the job and, you know, at, I guess at the end of Claude Harmon, Tom, you know, there wasn't much in the pro shop and Tom gets the job and all of a sudden he's, you know, having all kinds of merchandise delivered and Mo hated the boxes coming in. Like it interfered with his workspace. And, you know, the boxes would get delivered right to the back door of the bag room and Mo would take them and throw them out in the caddy yard. Like, you know, and Tom would be like, what are you doing? Like, you know, and then Tom got all this new merchandise in the pro shop and Mo always had the cigar going. So, you know, Tom closed the door not to be rude to Mo, but to just keep the cigar smoke from getting on all his brand new merchandise. And Mo got all upset. He was like, yeah, hey, you're trying to close me out, near 40, you know, you know. But, and Mo actually quit. He quit. So Tom had been there about a week and Mo was like, I quit. And he went up to Saratoga and, you know, a couple members had to go up there and talk to him and bring him back. And, uh, you know, it was very contentious at the beginning. But I said to Tom, I was like, Tom, look, the guy had been there 50 years, right? Like, that was 1978. 50 years he'd already been working there. And all of a sudden he gets a new boss. And, uh, but they, men, they, they got over it and they actually became like best friends. So you think about Mo's tenure he started the year before Bobby Jones won the first open held at Wingfoot right he wanted he asked me so I used to go out and play at night I said he said oh you go play last night junior and I'd say yeah and he'd be like what'd you hit in the 18 and he meant 18 west and I said oh I hit a six iron at 175 yards and he'd be like Bobby Jones flipped a little sandwich in there from 70 yards, 1929, <laughs> with a gut of percha ball. It's like, you're nothing, Junior. Really? No, he said, he told me Bobby Jones drove it over the hill in the 29 open. Wow. Incredible. He wasn't playing the back tee. Well, I don't know. I got that from Mo directly. Uh, but I used to ask him about it. He said it was like, you know, it was burned out, a little dry. Bobby Jones was a long hitter. I wasn't there for the Colin Montgomery thing, but um, so I remember when, when, so when the last day of the 2006 US Open, I was out on, I was trying to watch on the back of the West, but it was so crowded out there. You couldn't get near those guys. And I went in the bag room and they, so the pro shop was the, um, was cordoned off and uh but we could get in the back door of the bag room and they built like a temporary wall and, and the pro shop was where they went to sign their cards and i remember uh jeff ogilvy played with um ian poulter and they went in and i was standing in the back and ian poulter and jeff ogilvy signed their card in the pro shop and you know i think ogilvy was like all right well if, you know Ian Poulter said to him, like, you got a chance, like, you got a chance. And, he, and Ogilvy was like, no, nah, he's just going to par this hole. And then I'm, you know, I'll congratulate him. And then, you know, Phil butchered the hole and they shuffled Ogilvy out of there right away, you know. And then I left because I didn't want to see what was going on. But yeah. I couldn't yeah, see. They, I could hear. They felt like but, dominoes in the end there. Mickelson. Montgomery, a couple guys had had some serious chances the last three or four holes of that open. And yeah, it was you know, it was it was awful. But there's I you know Jim Furyk came back for one of the outings, um, and he was you know they he got hired by the group to come and you know play a couple holes with the group, and then at their post round he was speaking, and you know. He looked back out over Wingfoot. He was on a terrace and he was like, you know, he he regretted his 2006 US Open because he had a really good chance. Like he three putted 15. Yep. 
you know, never should have done that. And then he butchered 18. Otherwise, he would have won. So be it. That's history. So the 97 PGA was by far, like, for me, the best event. Um, because I just think, I think back, like, we had Nicholas played and uh, Watson and Ray Floyd. And, like, there were all these great players from the 70s and the 60s even that were here playing. And in the middle, you had, like, Greg Norman and, and Nick Faldo and Davis, of course. And then the young guy, like, Tiger won the Masters in 97. Um, so if you look back at that field, that 97 PGA, they had the best, they had by far the best field. Like it was the height of Tiger mania, like, you know, so like it was cool to be here for that. But I don't think we'll ever have a field that'll match that one to have Nicholas and yeah, Nicholas was still playing then and Tom Watson and, uh, you know, um, there were others, you know. You'll certainly uh, never get another shot with a rainbow in it like that. Yeah. And then also in the 97 PGA, we actually still were doing the, we were doing the bag room. Um, so like some of the pros actually like leave their bags in the bag room and they all kind of came back there at least once in a while. Like they didn't all leave their bags, but like if they went to get lunch or if they were, you know, taking a break or something, they would, they would leave their bags with us and then come back. So you know, we got a lot more interaction, you know, than we do now. Um, like we did the range this last one in 2020 and, you know, you got to see them a little bit, but, you know, there was a little more interaction in 97. And the other thing was, I remember uh, in the bag room, there was this guy, he was kind of like a gypsy guy who traveled with the tour and he set up a massage table and he had about four or five pros that would come in and get, you know, worked on, um, including there were two that were there all the time, Lee Jansen and Payne Stewart. And I just remember Payne Stewart, he was in there the whole time. So, Mike, did you, were you born with the temperament that you have, which is necessary to run the tournaments that you run at a club like this? Or did you have to learn that? I know people have to drive you crazy where you get wait lists. You don't have enough on the wait as list. A, too uh, many on the wait list. So as a tournament guy, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I am. And it's probably not the best thing. Maybe it is. I don't know, but I'm, I'm kind of a fly by the seat of my pants kind of guy. Like, and as, as a tournament guy, you probably should be more of a stickler. Um, you should be more, you know, detail, oriented and a little more organized than I am. I'm just like, kind of, okay, let's just wing it. Maybe it works here. Uh, I don't know. I've learned a couple things. Number one, you just treat everybody the same. That's, that's gotta be number one. And then, uh, you know, you gotta, you just gotta be fair. I don't lose sleep over it anymore. Um, but I remember like, you know, when we first started with the member guest and having to wait list guys and tell them they're not in and I, you know, I was doing it and, you know, I mean, I wait listed Rick Patino like every year and, you know, I would have to call him up and be like, Hey Rick, you know, you're not in. And he was, he's a great guy now, but you know, if back then he was coaching Louisville and, you know, very busy guy and you know it wasn't always easy i i waitlisted rob manfred every year and he's the commissioner of baseball and everyone knows i love baseball and then i you know i'd be like oh, i'm never gonna get tickets so <laughs> but but i did it because i just followed the letter of the law like you know i didn't care if you you know well you're stuck you were the commissioner of mlb or if you're you know whoever you were i just followed the rules and that's who got that's who got out. That's who got waitlisted. So, that's that's my only that's my only thing there. I but say with every tournament, there's it's going to end. There's going to be a winner, and you know the rest of it. You just do your best. But you handle it so well. I mean, I you know, I people are obviously disappointed, and on you know, depending on their mood or their 
personality, you know, some some take disappointment better than others, to put it mildly. So that's yeah. a tough position. And, you know, I know the membership every year at these tournaments, the ones that I do get in, there's nothing but appreciation for the work you do there. Well, thank you for saying that. I have to tell myself that the nibs for, you know, Steve Carlucci or, uh, you know, Paul Benson is like being in a playoff for the U.S. Open for, you know, Jeff Ogilvie or Phil Mickelson. Like, it's 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 their U.S. Open. So, you know, Can you, you imagine remember. Paul Benson in a playoff on uh, TV with the analytics on that swing? Yeah. But I remember the year he's oh. he's gotten a little he's gotten a little better he's a little straighter now like we oh, he's terrific that yeah. one that one year he was hitting it he hit the green like every time but he hit it out over the parking lot on yeah. ten and then bring it back in yeah no he's amazing it was automatic yeah he's a lot of fun to play with too he's a, he's a, a delightful good. game one year uh, one year I forget like Gilmore had the the bullhorn during the uh, we were doing a playoff for the Tilly. And everyone's standing around and, you know, I think it was, I think it was Mark Johnson who Mark won the Knicks. So he's, you know, he, and Mark played pro baseball, but I think Mark hit about six inches behind the ball <laughs> in the Tilly playoff and the ball went about three feet and you could hear a pin drop. Everyone was like, Oh, it yeah. just felt awful yeah. for him. And Gilmore's got the bullhorn and he's like, God, oh, it's like Gilmore said something like, yeah, don't worry, Mark, you hit the big ball. And like <laughs> he broke it up so that everybody laughed a little bit. But Mike, you've been there now with is it three head pros? Yeah. Yeah. Tom, John Busick, and Mike Gilmore. And what's that transition like for you as far as as it applies to your own duties? Is that pretty consistent? Yeah. They just the thing I think about the most is is there's a big cultural difference. Um, so when I first got there, um, like I think about that picture now that's in the pro shop um, with Claude and all his assistants. Uh, and then we have another one that's in there with Tom and all his assistants. So when I first got to Wingfoot, you know, the two assistants were Larry Rents and Richard Hatcher. And uh, they were, I mean, Larry was unbelievable. The assistant pros, even into Tom's time, were very heralded. They were very, you know, respected. Nowadays, you know, we have 12 guys working in the shop. They're all assistants, like, you know. Right. They run the gamut. Like, some of them can play. Some of them are just okay. But, you know, everybody teaches. Everybody, we, you know, we take a team approach now. whereas. When I first got there, you know, it was the assistants were like gods and we were just, you know, the guys that did all the work. Um, so I just remember that in my early years, I, Larry rents to me, you know, I went out when I first got to Wingfoot and I played golf in college. I thought I was okay. And I went out and played with Larry and I was like, Oh my guy, God, this guy, he could, you know, he could hit a guy. We went ball. off. So the first time I went to play with him on 10 West, he hits it to like three feet, knocks it in on 11. He hits like, you know, four iron and then a wedge to like six feet, knocks it in. And I'm like, okay, I'm two down. And then I go to 12 West and he bombs it. So he finally takes out his driver. And I'm like, okay. And he hits it so far, but he hits it way right. And I hit it down the middle and I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to get this guy here. <laughs> and his ball, he hit it so far, he was almost in the fairway on 17. And, you know, I hit my second shot and then I hit my third shot on the green. And it turns out I didn't see Larry because there were so many trees back then. Between right. The but he hit his second shot from kind of like the, the fairway on 17. He hit a two iron into the right front bunker. Oh. 
on 12, <laughs> up over the trees with a two iron. Like and then he eight. takes a little sandwich and flips it up to a foot and he taps it in for a birdie. And I was like, and then he's like, okay. oh, I got to go. And he, and he goes and <laughs> plays 17 and 18. And I was just like, oh my God. After he left, then Bruce Sabrisky came in and Bruce was unbelievable how good he was. He never missed a shot. And then the year after that, we had Mike Bruce Allen. Bruce was a kind of a warm and fuzzy guy too, right? Yeah. I like, <laughs> I got a little great with Bruce. But he was, he could be, you Direct. just had to understand him. Yeah. Well, he said to Hank Malfoy one time, Hank, you know, he goes up to Hank and he says, if you couldn't chip and putt, you wouldn't break 80. <laughs> and I was like, there's oh a better God. way to he say just, that. <laughs> he just said that to Hank Melfa, like, and Hank steamed out of the room, like, he's so mad. Yeah. But then if you got to know Bruce, Bruce was actually complimenting Hank's short game. It was like Bruce saying, hey, Bruce, you got a great short game. Right. It's just yeah, he interviewed over at Siwanoi after, um, when they were looking for a pro, they ended up hiring Grant Turner, who was excellent. But I, I think Bruce shot maybe a 61 in the uh, in one of the rounds he played there. So well, his, his golf knowledge was extremely high because I had managed, I remember taking a lesson from him and he had taken lessons from Harvey Penick. No, he was a, he was a great teacher, Bruce. He, he was he was spot on. So you were there through the Joey Neaporti years too, then? No, obviously. I got to know Joe, and I Joe is Joe is my great friend. Um, but Joe did Joe didn't work here when I was here. Like I said, I got to know him really well just from knowing the Neaportis. Yeah, he's a great so, teacher too, Joey. Joe was yeah, Joe was great. Mike Allen, what about him? Nice guy. The best thing I say about Mike Allen is that he was. He didn't have any golf business scar tissue. Like he came straight from the tour. Like, I remember, I remember when we when we hired him. Tom had a stack of resumes on his desk, and we were hiring. You know, and John Neaporti was there, and we were looking through the resumes, and everyone's you know. So all of a sudden, we get to this one, and I'm reading it, and I still couldn't believe it. You know, Irish Open winner. You know, it's just tour event after tour event, like second place, third place, third, you know, like two pages of this. And I, and I said, Tom, hire this guy. <laughs> and he did. So um, he was, he was awesome, awesome player. Just, you know, but I mean, like I said, he had no golf business experience whatsoever. Like he yeah. came straight from the tour. But I remember one day I said to him, like, Mike, can you stand in the pro shop for 10 minutes? And the phone rings and everybody who works in the golf business goes saying, golf shop, Michael speaking, or, you know, you say your name and you know, it's a way to answer the phone. Not this guy picks up the phone. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so the guy on the other end goes, who's this? <laughs> and Mike goes, you called me. Who's this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mike was, that way, I, I, there was a guy, Jim Gallagher, who was an old, kind of a crusty guy. And he, Carrie stepped in, who was here. He tried to give him lessons for years. And he tried to get him to change his grip, and he wouldn't. And then Mike Allen goes down there, and the guy goes like this. He's gripping him like this, and he blows smother hooks on the range. And he's like, so Mike goes, the first thing we got to do is change your grip. And Jim Gallagher goes, nah, I, don't, I like my grip. I want to keep, keep gripping it like this. And Mike goes, fine. And he just walks away. <laughs> <laughs> so he was like, yeah, if you don't want to get better, I'm leaving. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to waste my time. That train of assistance, it's like a farm league for um, the golf business. Yeah, I remember when we hired uh, Frank Benzel after – Mike Allen, I was kind of like, you know, I, I, I said to Tom, I was like, I'm a little, I'm a little disappointed here, you know, like after having Larry and Bruce and Mike Allen, I was like, Frank Benzel, you know, kid from White Plains, like 
but then Frank, Frank was awesome. Yeah. You know, he, he could, I mean, he played as well as any of them. And, and Carrie and Grant Sturgeon. I mean, there's so many. And then come. Billy Van Orman. And then it was just one after another. Yeah. Uh, but that was the deal back then. Like if you were kind of the best guy in the area, you came to Winkfoot and you did a couple of years. And then you fast forward, to, we had guys like Mike Ballow and uh, Adam Renault and uh, Grant Sturgeon. And they were actually working. Like they yeah. were yeah. actually like pricing shirts and, and you know, all one job. answering phones and re-gripping. Yeah, so things changed a lot. I, I think back to even, not to, not to Tom every now and then, like when Jay, Jay was in the shop like all the time. And yeah, Tom, he lived there. Tom would, you know, sit in his office and pay his bills. That's that's basically, you know, that was our core lineup. I would be in the bag room, Jay would be in the pro shop, and Tom would be in his office doing all the accounting. And every now and then, Jay would be like, oh, I got to go. I got to go. You know, I got a meeting or something. And Tom would be like, okay, I'll cover the shop. And Tom <laughs> would go stand behind the counter and, you know, it would just be like, Hey, Mike, do we have any gloves? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Well, you have a great story to tell us. I mean, Alicia told us some stories about Tom. Tom, I have a million, but I'll, I'll tell you this story. Tom was down, when Tom was down in Florida, he didn't play golf that much in the winter, but once in a while he'd go play with a member of Florida. And he gets down there one year and he, had, he didn't have a golf ball in his bag and he goes into the shop at say Seminole or something like that. And he goes, I need a sleeve of balls. Like, give me a sleeve of Titleist. And he puts a five dollar bill. And the pro is like, that'll be like $18 <laughs> or whatever. It was like $13. And Tom was like, I thought a sleeve of balls was three bucks. And <laughs> I was like, I was like, you've been a pro. And, Winkler for 20 years paying all those bills like you know, but he had no idea how much a sleeve of balls cost so he had never bought one um, but tom was uh you know he was he was the best he used to at lunch like i ate lunch with him every day in the grill and tom would just tell us stories and uh, they were they were just classic he played the tour and like you know uh yeah, he was he was on and off, and you know, he he had great stories. Like that. I remember there was one. He he played in Phoenix, and the next day he had to drive to Dallas, and he's driving with. I want to say the guy's name was Butch Butch Beard. Um, yeah, Butch Beard. Yeah, he was Butch Beard, and Butch had a stutter, so he would, you know, he kind of bounce his words and Tom's knew the road to get to from Phoenix to Dallas so this, they have to drive overnight to get there so they leave it dark and they, Tom says I'll drive the first half you drive the second half so Tom drives halfway and then he wakes Butch Beard up and he says all right you take over I'm gonna go to sleep and he says there's a gas station in about an hour, and you got to stop at the gas station and fill up. And Butch is like, okay. And then they get to this gas station. All of a sudden, the guy comes out, big, huge guy comes out, and he says, K -k 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 can I help you? But, but he stutters. <laughs> and Butch, <laughs> he doesn't want to say, F -f 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 fill her up to the, so he just hits the gas peels off down the road and he wakes tom up and says you gotta go back and had all kinds of stories like that <laughs> was there any pro that you worked with at wingfoot or elsewhere that kind of helped you bring your game to where it's become now best, maybe your father-in-law the best one well i've learned probably as much from him as anybody else Besides Tom, I'd have to say Tom and I, we talk so much, but he never really, like, we never, you know, he, he'd give me pointers here and there, but I never really worked with him, but I learned a lot from him. But the best lesson I ever got was from Bruce Zabriskie. He, he fixed me, like, you know, right, but that was a long time ago. That was 
1995. Alicia yeah. helps me a lot too, <laughs> but lately, uh, you know, I don't know. I think we've, what's happened lately, like back then you really needed to go to a pro to get a lesson. And nowadays, like with TrackMan and YouTube and all the resources, like, you know, everybody, the information's there. You just got to, you, you got to apply it. Sometimes you need a, a second set of eyes. I've learned from every single one of these guys that's been through. I've learned from Ballo. I've learned from Adam in recent times. And I, you know, um, I've learned from James Ando. I learned from, you know, all, every single one of these guys uh, has taught has taught me something. The deepest relationship I've had now is probably with Alicia Debos, just, just because she's been here so long. We always like to ask, and I'm going to modify the question, Billy. So there's eight par threes at Wingfoot. Forget about three East. That's out. Now there's only that's, all, seven. that's taken. That's everybody taken. else took that already. Yeah, everybody else took one. It. What's the one par three for a large sum of money that you're going to play to make a par or better? You got to make a par or better to win the bet. Which of the other seven par threes at Wingfoot? That's a really good question. There's no right <laughs> answer there. I don't know. I would I would probably have to go with uh, seven west. I guess would be maybe because uh, thirteen's not easy. Thirteen uh, east. Thirteen east. And then yeah, and uh, ten west I is right out. West. Seventeen west is right out of the out of the running. Yeah. I played 10 well, but that used to be my thing because I used to go, when I was working in the bag room, it's right I used there. to go right out the door and play 10. I probably played 10 more than any other, any every other hole at Wingfoot. So I sure were if you had to win a hole, I would go 17 East. Because right. 17 East, you just know if you just, you know, give yourself a putt for par, the other guy's going to make both. So, so would you matter, take your, would you take Jimmy's approach to 17 and to, Put something down in front and if it runs up great yeah yeah definitely he told me once when he plays like match play on the east and he was very upset about 15 east um because 15 east remember he used to have a much more severe false front yep and but he used to say because if he got in a match play situation he said i just got to get this match to 15 east because 15 east you can win it with a par. Um, and then he said 16 East, you can win it with a par. 17 East, you can win it with a par. And then 18, anything can happen. Uh, but he used to think that 15 East, when it had the, you know, the false front that started like, you know, it was like halfway into the green. So if you didn't get it into that back third. You um, come back down to the water. It would come all the way down. And then you made, it was tough up and down. Um, so he says that's his theory. Now it's easy to get the ball on the green on 15, the new green, and then you can, you know, probably two putt. So it's not as hard a hole as it used to be back in the day. But, what do you think is the yeah. toughest green to putt at Wingfoot? The toughest green to read. Different thing. Well, one west is definitely the, uh, you know, the most. The it's the most undulating, difficult green there. I'd say toughest green to read. Wow. Yeah, because one one's readable. It's just hard to putt it. Yeah, you know what green is tough to read is uh is eight west. I think that one kind of baffles people. Um, a fifteen east nowadays. I think fifteen east is not the same green as it used to be, but you know the putts there kind of go opposite of what you think. Some of the newer greens are tough, tough to read. Eight East is not the same as it used to be, you know. So if you have the scar tissue from back in the day and you remember those old putts, they're not. They're, they're not, not there the anymore. Yeah. You yeah. know, Gil did a great job of trying to put them back the way they were, but you know, they're they're not they're not those those five or six greens on the East are not not the same. So you get a Tucson, you're going out tomorrow beautiful day and you get your choice of one guy to play with and here's your choices tiger woods jack nicholas arnold palmer or ben hogan who are you going to choose as the other guy to play with you that 18 holes wow depends if you're oh. playing for money or not right <laughs> i think i would say arnold 
Tom played with Ben Hogan, and Tom told me how tough Ben was, that he's not very talkative. So I don't know that he'd be open. So that's by default leaves Arnie, I guess. And Arnie had great, great stories too. And yeah. You know, Arnie could be your friend. Uh, yeah, I'll go with Arnie. Friends with Hogan, and Hogan was mean to him. Tom, Tom played with Hogan in the final round of the PGA one year. He told me the story. He said, he said, like, I tried to talk to him and he, he was basically like, he wouldn't. Tom says, Ben hits a shot. Tom goes, nice shot, Ben. You know. What would you know I, about a nice shot? Ben <laughs> says nothing. And then, so after, it's three holes of this. Tom says he's hitting everything pure. And Tom's just like, nice shot. And then finally on the fourth hole, Ben says, Tom, I'll tell you when I hit a nice shot. <laughs> and Tom said, all right. And he just kept his mouth shut the rest of the time. And then on 17, <laughs> he hasn't talked to him now for two hours. <laughs> On 17, Ben Hogan hits one just perfect. And it almost goes in a hole. And he turns to Tom and he says, There, that was a nice shot. And that was all that's all he ever said to him. He said, I'll tell you when. And then he told him when. But I can see Tom, like, hey, nice shot, Ben. <laughs> nice shot, Ben. You got a favorite um, movie? It's it's kind of a cop out, but when they make Caddyshack, as somebody who's worked in this business for 30 years, like they absolutely nailed it. Like, you know, you, to think that that movie was 40 years ago, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting in the locker room at Winfoot right now. And you know where the guy, where Judge Smales walks in and he's like, you know, the two guys are there playing cards and he goes, don't you people have homes? You know, <laughs> yeah. like that is so spot on. It's still true. So, I was in here, I went in there to try and hook up the Zoom in the card room and there's somebody in there just hanging out on a Monday in March, you know, and I'm like, don't you people have homes? And then, <laughs> yeah, you know, you have homes and then, to go to? You have to be on the podcast, come on. <laughs> and then the other, the other one is, uh, like, I said this to Gilmore, like, you know, when, when Danny Noonan is going to grab uh, Ty Webb, Chevy chases the bag and Chevy comes up to him and he's like, hey, you know, give me the driver. And he's like, you know, he's got Judge Smale's bag because he made a business decision. And I said, that's just like Chris Lewis, you know, because <laughs> yeah. Chris Lewis has, you know, Steve Mara or Charlie Shoner or, you know, Bridget Bruni. Like, you know, it's like if they all three played together, he's, you know, who's going to win out, you know? So that Bridget. still happens to this day. It's always Bridget, yes. 101st year, actually. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I hope so you've been you've been here for almost a third of them. Well, you make it look simple, Mike, and your attitude toward Wingfoot each and every year. You've been there each and every day, each and every tournament that you interact with a lot of lunkheads. You do a great job. And it goes without saying that it's so appreciative and keep it up because you're you 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 are you're the you're replaceable. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, thank you for saying that. And this has been great. I used to go out and play at night. And I said, he said, oh, you go play last night, Junior? And I'd say, yeah. And he'd be like, what'd you hit into 18? And he meant 18 West. And I said, oh, I hit a six iron at 175 yards. And he'd be like, Bobby Jones flipped a little sandwich in there from 70 yards, 1929, <laughs> with a gutter perch a ball. It's like you're nothing, Junior. <laughs> Thanks for joining Billy us Casper, today. Billy Horner. We really appreciate your Double feedback. Indemnity. And please Marky. subscribe to the Two show. Adder. And hit Claude the bell Harmon. icon so you get notified. Movie classics. Of new episodes. Mark Gable. Hit them hard. Job. And hit them off. That's 36 holes.